So without dwelling in too much detail about the same, then there is CAPF certificate, which is used for creating the certificate trust list, I'm sorry. And also it is used for endpoint encryption. That is, the phones will leverage the locally significant certificate or mix and would establish TLS with CUCM. At the same point in time, they are able to establish SRTP with another encrypted endpoint. That can be another phone or a gateway. Phone certificates can be divided broadly into phone VPN and SAST. And the phone VPN certificate is used for remote phones that has now replaced a Cisco VPN phone as we better know it. Now, this service has replaced TLS proxy and phone proxy because they are no longer supported with communication manager release 9.x. So essentially the only option is to go ahead with, and, and I would say it's a better option, is to phone VPN, to have the hardware phone and leverage the VPN built-in client on the phone itself. If you browse to the CUCM OS admin graphical user interface or GUI and go to security, go to certificate management, you can see a list of certificates. And these are probably all the certificates you'll see there. Uh, some of these may might be al already there. They more they will be already there. In in my case, I have imported some more certificates within the server for different purposes. But then, as you can see, there is Tomcat, there is IPsec, then there is Call Manager, there is CAPF, TBS. Now, what you can also observe is there are two type of certificate stores. There is a trust certificate store, and there is a simple certificate. Now, a trust in this case is the root. That is, if I want to initiate a secure connection with CUCM administration or OS admin GUI, a trust certificate will authenticate the client I'm trying to connect with because that is the root of trust. However, what I'm trying to access is the actual Tomcat service and that is served by the Tomcat certificate. So Tomcat certificate, the top one in the list, tomcat.pen, will be leveraged when I'm trying to hit HTTPS IP address of CUCM or host name of CUCM. However, in the background, the validity of the certificate or authentication or identity of the certificate has been authenticated by Tomcat Trust. So as you can see, there are multiple Tomcat Trust certificates here. I have a VeriSign certificate, and I also have a built-in Tomcat Trust, that is a self-signed certificate. So end of day, it depends upon whether I have externally signed certificate or am I using only self-signed certificate. So trust acts always in the background. It's the actual certificate or cert, certificate type cert, which you hit when you try to leverage a service. What are some CUCM certificate essentials? As I mentioned earlier in the previous slide, there are two type of certificate stores, certificate type trust and certificate. So it's the actual certificate which is leveraged by the service. However, the validity or the identity of the certificate is authenticated in each single transaction by the trust certificate. Now trust acts as a local route for the certificate. As, it, as I also mentioned earlier, it's, it's a, it can be self-signed, it can be third-party signed certificate or CA root certificate. So essentially trust acts as a route for whichever certificate service we want to leverage. And each node, it is important to understand that certificates are based on host names. As we saw earlier during the first section of the presentation, that the common name was the host name. It can be a fully qualified domain name like abc.corp.local, or it can be abc. But anyhow, in any whatsoever matter, it will be a name. It cannot be an IP address. So certificates by their very nature will always leverage host name. So for example, if you try to sign the Tomcat certificates within your organization and then expect the users to still access UCM by the IP address and not to get a certificate error, that is not going to work out because then the users have to be educated that they need to use the UCM name instead of the IP address to access their CCM user pages. Only then the certificate kicks in and comes into action. So what that also implies in turn is that the all the servers in a cluster, say I have a 10 member cluster or I have a 15 member cluster irrespective, every member in a cluster is installed with a unique name 
and therefore every member in a cluster will have a unique certificate to it to prove its own identity. So if we are signing a single certificate on a single server, then it is expected that all the users will be going to that server. If it's an enterprise-wide thing, then ideally all the server certificates should be signed, whether they are external, internal certificate authorities. So all the server certificates must be signed because each server it's, has its own unique identity in terms of its common name, that is the host name, and that name is reflected in the certificate. So what we also have is, if you go to, again, CUCM, uh, Unified Operating System Administration, go to Security Certificate Management, as you can see in the snapshot at the bottom of the page. It offers you the ability to do certificate management. It offers you the ability to monitor certificates for expiry. Offers you the ability to look for certificate revocation. We'll discuss this towards the end of the session. And then there is bulk certificate management. That is, you can export or import certificates in bulk, which is specifically used for services like Extension Mobility Cross Cluster, EMCC, because in that case, you have to have certificates from another cluster in, in one from one cluster to another where the user is going to hot desk between two or more clusters. So there are various formats that uh, one should understand while dealing with certificates specifically a call manager can support various type of certificates, majorly or broadly classifying into DER, or Distinguished Encoding Rule, or PEM, which is Privacy Enhanced Mail. So a DER is a binary encoded certificate, and it's all special characters. None of the characters can be easily read or understood. Whereas PEM is a base 64 certificate standard, and it can be opened up in a text editor, and it has a clear begin certificate and an end certificate, so you can recognize where the certificate begins from and where it ends. So you can copy and paste only that part, say, into iOS enrollment, or when generating a CSR, you can understand, yes, this, uh, this certificate is, is beginning from this place till this place. Although it is also more or less like scrambled text, but that's how a certificate should be. Now, what also comes along with DER and PEM formats is CER, Certificate Format, Certificate Trust, and CSR, a Certificate Signing Request. These are the extensions to any existing formats of a certificate. So a certificate, when you open up in Windows, can be .CER, could be .DER, could be .PEM, but the Windows Certificate Viewer, which is an excellent certificate tool as well, will open them up irrespectively in the same manner. So when you look at a CA certificate, this is how ideally a CA certificate would look like. Now many a times there is a question that how can I differentiate between a certificate I'm looking at, whether that's a certificate issued by a certificate authority or it's an identity certificate, that is it was issued to a server. The simple answer is look at the issuer CN and look at the subject CN. If they both match, in this case, you can look at uh, row number four, the issuer name, common name is APGC, PDI, PDICA, and then the subject name, which is the seventh row, it's all, it also has a similar common name. That is, this was issued by the CA to itself, so it's the root certificate, irrespective. Now, when you compare this with an identity certificate, which we will soon do, you'll see that there is a marked difference between the two. The common name for the subject name will differ from the issuer name because issuer will still remain the root CA, whereas the subject name will be the name for the server to which the certificate was issued. So when we generate a CSR, this is what I was talking about, PEM format, you will get something like on the same lines. You'll get a begin certificate request, and at the end you'll have end certificate request. In between you'll have the scramble text, which you can look at. It's, it's scramble, but it's still readable because they are, they are ASCII characters. Now here comes the identity certificate, or a certificate that was issued to a server by a CA. So in this case, you can again compare the issuer name. The common name is APJC, PDI, hyphen PDI, hyphen CA. However, now if you look at the subject name, it is cucm90.apjcpdi.lab. Now that itself tells you that this is a certificate issued by 
TDICA to UCM90, that is probably the name of the communication manager, the host name of the call manager. And then there is a domain suffix to it, and then there is other information. But the common name itself is, is pretty much uh, telling you that this is not a CA certificate, this is an identity certificate. With that, we come to the section where we'll take a deep dive into understanding of CUCM certificates and their function. So CUCM Tomcat certificate, the development in terms of Tomcat has been interesting from earlier Windows versions to the Linux appliance-based version. Now Tomcat is not just doing the GUI encryption or redirection to secure URL, it is also taking care of secure LDAP communication. So essentially, the CUCM Tomcat certificate, when a call manager is installed, it is already there. We need not do anything. The moment we try to access the interface, it automatically redirects us to a secure interface. So essentially, in the background, it's already in the works. 